Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rethink the Road. With our unique challenges and games, we take our entrepreneurs on a trip down memory lane and make them rethink the road that, the, that got them to where they are. Today, we have with us the founder of S4 Capital, Sir Martin Sorel. And so after graduating from the University of Cambridge and Harvard Business School, Sir Martin joined a wire sh shopping basket producer as chief, chief executive. And more, well, people might more recognize that as the largest advertising and PR agency today, WPP. Sir Martin founded S4 Capital, a digital advertising and marketing services company housing Media Monks and Mighty Hive Incorporated. Now, I'm sure I've missed a lot from your 50 plus year journey so far, but hopefully we unpack as much of that as we continue. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm going to bend the rules a little bit. All right, so I, I've got, I think I've got 65 characters. Oh, wow. So I should get, and I'm not done an emoji or a hashtag. I, I found a GIF actually, which, which I, I don't think I can get onto the screen, but the, 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 the GIF is entitled, The Little Wimp Disrupted the Class. Uh, the, the Twitter pitch, here it goes. Disrupting digital data-driven content, media, faster, better, cheaper, unitary. That's it. Wow, nice. Um, you know, one word stands out to me from that, uh, which is unitary, and that's another thing we'll we'll come back to right. um, later on. But super interesting. Um, absolutely love the work with us for capital, and you know, um, just in terms of like your your depart from WPP and then coming to us for capital, I noticed that in the press you still well speak a lot about WPP and much of it is not not the most positive so yeah, i just wanted to know how come you know this in like stakeholders generally wouldn't um want to bash well, yeah, well you know it's very simple like, really i mean yeah i i started as you said uh and uh wpp uh from from nothing built it into um you know with 200,000 other people or 130,000 other people really could be exclude the associates as company we, we owned 51% of. Um, we built it into the, the largest advertising and marketing services company and therefore, you know, like any uh, so-called entrepreneur, that's a much misused word. Often people use the word entrepreneur when they're risking other people's money, not their own, but an entrepreneur means risking your own money not somebody else's um but but you know we're very entrepreneur and when you're an entrepreneur you have a tie to that business you know an emotional tie psychological tie which uh, is very difficult to shake off it's what i've always said that it's the nearest a man can come to having a baby not literally but figuratively uh, is to is to create a business or start a business from scratch so so i i talk in it I talk about it because it's like you know, family. That's, I mean, yeah, that's that's what I think. Yeah, for me, that's what more like being an entrepreneur is—is is that emotional link, um, being so connected to the business that whether it's doing well or not, it hits you like right in the heart every single time. And you know, just speaking about the sheer size of WPP and and now S4 Capital as well. Uh, I think it's it's a good foray into our next cha challenge, which is called Unexpected Expected. So so let me let me start off with something um, that that is quite sort of hits you in the face when someone first reads your name, which is being knighted. Is that something you expected, or was that completely unexpected? It was, to it was totally unexpected, actually. I mean, the the the, the letter arriving. Um, you know, it was ter totally out of the blue, and they said, you know, you're on pain of death. You you shouldn't tell anybody. And I, and I, my mother, my father had died sadly, but my my mother was still alive. And uh, I, on pain of death, I, I told my mother, which was an extremely dangerous thing to do, because like every Jewish mother or grandmother, she had a proclivity to telling everything, uh, telling everybody everything, and you know about their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, whatever it is. So it was a very, very risky thing to do. 
but uh, on pain of death, I told her. So it was a surprise, actually, a total surprise. And I, I got it, uh, it was in the Millennium list. So it was a list compiled by Tony Blair as Prime Minister. Um, and I got it for services to the industry, not for charity, not for um, other services, but for the, for the, for the business. And, and, you know, it was, uh, it was marvellous. But no, I, I, look, I, the nice thing about it was it was a total surprise. You know, we, and, and I always remember um, that when um, we had our difficulties in, in the early 90s, uh, you know, we, we, I, I, I engineered two, well, there were, there were probably more, but there were two hostiles that we did. One was JWT and one was Ogilvy, and I, I, I over leveraged for Ogilvy and we had a, a rescheduling and, uh, um, of our debt. And then we had a debt for equity swap. And I always remember my then CFO turning to me <laughs> and said, bang goes the knighthood. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, it, it, look, it was a surprise. It was a very pleasant surprise. And uh, it was a very interesting conversation with the Queen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there aren't too many people in the world that can say that. Um, but yeah, so then, so, so let's move on to the next one. So what about your fallout with WPP? Was that something you expected, saw coming or completely unexpected? Well, uh, you know, if, if I saw it coming, coming, then it was, it's a very interesting question. If I saw it coming, then I, I probably would have done something about it. So that, that was probably partly my fault. Um, no, look, I, I think. Uh, the, the the chairman of the company. I mean, the only advice I would give is choose your chairman carefully. I've said that several times, and I think that's important. Um, but clearly, he had an agenda uh, and had a view, um, and you know, I, I think it was engineered. In fact, I'm I'm certain it was. Um, now, I chose to go. I mean, I could have sort of stuck it out if I if I wanted to. But I didn't think it was the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, I think part of what we're doing, you know, part of it was I didn't want to retire my mother's genes. Part of it was because I didn't want to do portfolio or play golf. But it was also because I wanted to demonstrate clearly that we could build a business that was more attuned to to modern day digital living. And you know, this, as I said in the in the tweet, you now the it's a disrupting digital content, data, and digital media force that we're building. And the, the advantage that we have is we had a clean sheet of paper three years ago, two and a half years ago. And the advantage we have is that we're totally focused on digital. I mean, we were getting, a, we're getting uplift from the pandemic because the pandemic has, has accelerated digital transformation for consumers and media and enterprises. But in addition to that, uh, we, you know, digital disruption, even, even outside the pandemic and the rebound that you're seeing, and we have two tailwinds. One is the GDP growth this year at 5 to 6% next year, 4 to 5, because of the, the rebound. And then that's a sort of cyclical impact or tailwind. And then the secular tailwind is around digital transformation, which, you know, digital is just over half of the digital media marketplace, which is about... 550 billion, 600 billion, it's over half, and it'll be 70% by 2026. So, you know, that, that the, the, the entire conversation around S4 Capital is a good, um, it, it kind of sort of aids my next question, which was, you know, the idea of the unitary method, do you think you would have been able to sort of embody that if you hadn't left WPP? Well, we were trying. I mean, I, it, horizontality is a word that is banned. I spoke to somebody WPP last week, and he, he or she, was um, very concerned that they're going in the wrong direction. That all, all they're doing, that, that that you know, it's like like being in the Saragasso Sea. They're they're sort of just drifting, and um, what they're doing is just just enforcing more the verticals and what you've got to do is have it as one firm you can't have it but so the unitary structure I mean the answer to your question I would have you know with the benefit of 2020 hindsight I would be more violent on horizontality and 
you know, have enforced that. The answer to your question is, uh, knowing, knowing what I know now, I would be much more violent in bringing everything together as one, whether it was called WPP or whatever. Here, we're into it immediately because integration, that unitary structure is really critically important. Yeah, and, and, and just on that topic, I, I recently spoke to someone like a, a, an executive as, at Nestle India, and, and my question to them was around the, <clears throat> the idea that they have, I think like six coffee brands just in India, all cannibalizing on each other's sort of market market share yeah. revenue. And, and I asked them, why not, why not mix it into one coffee brand with a range? And, and they said that this is just how the company was built and it, it, integrating them at this point would just be almost impossible. Well, it's a very interesting, you see, I always liken the advertising holding model, you know, which, which I was not responsible for. I mean, people look, say often, you know, that I was one of, not the person, uh, you know, whether it was Saches or WPP or Omicom or whatever. But you actually go back to Marion Harper and IPG in the 1950s. So this is a model that's been around for 70 years. And if McKinsey's right, you know, that the average company lasts about 17 years now in the S&P 500 or FTSE 100, you know, this is past its sell-by date just on that criterion alone. However, that Nestle coffee thing that you mentioned is exactly the same. You know, when I was at WPP, JWT and Ogilvy naturally went together because JWT had Unilever, Ogilvy had Unilever, and then you had Ford and Ford. So you had a combination of good clients, but you also had conflicts that you could manage through the different channels. And I remember when we took over Gray, which took us heavily into Procter & Gamble, you know, I actually, I went to Unilever and, and, and discussed with them. I, I told them what we were going to do. And and you know whether they were happy with it and they, in the end they were happy with it and we built another vertical but it's exactly the, the i'll use the nestle coffee example in the future because it's exactly the same you build a bigger market share but you don't build integration yeah no i i, I do agree that um there is a certain level of incentivization that comes from competition within a company but but not to the point where the can well there, there are there are you know different models i mean bernard arnaud who's i think uh, if he's not the richest man in the world <laughs> today he was a few days ago and 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 is still very nearly the richest man in the world is the best manager of brands that there is on the planet without a doubt i mean he and he manages these brands separately so there is there is a an argument that that is the best thing to do you know get the best possible people you can running the best possible brands that you can and business you can and let them get on with it that's you know i don't know whether i'm summarizing his approach uh, correctly <laughs> or not but that appears to be the approach that like our next se section is like taking a step back but just before that on the on the like to close off the the conversation on s4 capital so it's, it's been three years you're in 31 countries, approximately 5,000 people, and a market cap of around 3.2 billion pounds. Was that something you expected, like that level of growth in such a short time? Uh, no, I, I thought we'd do well. I think we've done, you know, I think to be honest, I think we've done better than we expected, but we never had really sort of firm expectations. I mean, if you'd said to me when we started, what do I think we were going to be after a year or two years? I mean, we are ambitious. I mean, we're about, 144, 145 in the FTSE, I think, uh, if you, you know, we're a standard listing. So because of the dual class structure, we've got um, share class structure, but, um, you know, so you could say an ambition is to get into the FTSE 100. So we would probably have to increase our market cap from just over three to probably five. Uh, and everybody else would have to stand still, which obviously they won't. Um, so I think that's, you know, that would be an objective to become a FTSE 100 company uh, in fairly quick time. But, I don't, you know, we didn't set any objective. And it's the same thing with WPP. I mean, if you'd said to me, you know, uh, two and a half years into WPP, you know, we, we, we would have done, we did JWT by then. Um, you know, did I think you know, we were going to do that? I, I would have to say probably not. But, but we, I mean, we just start, 
from being very ambitious. I mean, we, we don't have specific goals. I mean, I've heard people in similar situations say, you know, we're capped at a billion, we want to be five billion or 10 billion. And we, we don't say anything like that. I mean, that's not, that's not in our thinking. We just want, you know, we, we the, the, the basic mission is to disrupt, to create the new advertising marketing service model and disrupt the old. And the four pillars are, you know, purely digital, the data-driven content and and digital media model, which we call the Holy Trinity, faster, better, cheaper, and unitary structure. It's very simple. So um, we're ambitious, but we don't really have, you know, sort of big hairy goals around market cap or, or that sort of thing. Well, okay, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there have been like along your journey a lot of challenges and we have we have like sort of touched upon some of them but to really get to the crux of it we we play this game called two lies one truth um i, I you say challenge I, I would say opportunity i mean if you don't grasp the opportunity it becomes a challenge so here are my three the first is global domination the second is conversion at scale. And the third is taking WPP over. From, from, from what we've spoken about and from my research, probably uh, conversion at scale. That's right, you're right. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of the difference between, um, you know, I, I don't know if you follow Formula One. Um, yeah, I do, but I, I was on the board of Formula One for nine years, so I know, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. So I, this, this is what I call the difference between teams like Red Bull and Mercedes is that Mercedes just wants to be the best that it can be. And Red Bull just wants to beat Mercedes. <laughs> and, and I think that there's two very different sentiments there. And I, I, I personally prefer the one where you just want to be the best that you can be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's why I chose conversion at scale. <laughs> no, so no. Everybody looks at this and say global domination, and they look at this and say they get to take over WPP. But what we're really interested in is proving the model. Yeah, okay, super interesting. So now a bit of um, sort of diversion from the talk about S four Capital and a bit more into into your personal life. So we to, right. to get into that, we we play the rapid fire, and right. there's a time limit of five seconds. For each of wow, that, that's going to be that's going to be difficult for me. Oh boy, I need to think about these things. I'm an old man. I'm 76, so you've got to give me you've got to give me 10 seconds. <laughs> How many all-nighters did you pull in your first year of S4 Capital? I don't think I pulled. I don't think I pulled one all-nighter. I mean, and late nights and early mornings, but not one all-nighter. Okay, did you ever question whether it was worth it? No. When did you make your first profit? Uh, we made, well, it depends how you define profit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, ta tax profit, I, I think um, we still, if you know, after all, uh, all the extraordinary items, I think even last year, uh, no, but on an EBITDA basis, we were up, we were profitable pretty much from the beginning. Okay, awesome. Um, one word to describe your emotion when you first raised money. Pleased. <laughs> uh, emotion when you first fired someone. Oh, it's horrendous. It's horrendous. It's never pleasant. You know, my father used to say delays are negative and it's a horrible thing to do. You know, when people say, what's, what's the purpose of S4? I say to provide employment. And I'm very proud of the fact we're up to 5,500 people. If, if the average number of dependents per person is say three, or that's probably 15,000 people. You know, WPP, I could argue it was 200,000 people and it's therefore 600,000 people. Who would, I'm very proud of the fact that within two and a half years, we now have, if it's 15,000 people, dependent on us for their livelihood. And that's something I take very seriously. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. <clears throat> and that's yeah, that's the purpose. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I sometimes get a little bit frustrated around the, the purpose area um, in terms of what people say and and how they 
you know, and virtue signaling and everything. I mean, our virtue, our virtue signaling is around jobs. That's that's what we want to do. We want to provide more opportunities for our people, better opportunities for our people. That's basically the purpose. Yeah, and especially to have done this in a, in a year like the like the last one. It, yeah, yeah, I think I think that's a tremendous achievement, and that's something I'm, uh, as I say, I'm very proud of. Okay, nice. Um, so the next question is, <clears throat> what is the weirdest place from where you have worked? Weirdest one. Well, I saw it in a basement in uh, Lincoln's Inn Fields. I mean, it was pretty weird. I mean, I, I, you know, I had my first room with uh, Preston Rabel and Robert Lowell uh, with wire and plastic products was was um, Angus Grossart, Noble Grossart Investment Bank. Lincoln's in fields, very nice building, right hand room, one room, and the three of us sat in a room together and we had one PA between us. That was the that that was pretty well, that wasn't weird. But then we moved from there to a basement uh, under the Lincoln's in car park. Um so so usually next we have a question on on when do you think you'll retire? But I think I think we leave that question. I, 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 I will die on the job. Next question, uh you know, it's it's been a 50 plus year journey with a lot of ups and downs. So how many enemies did you make in the process? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be able to count them with, with your 10 fingers? I don't know. No, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And then uh, just like the final few questions are around um, your general everyday. So do you prefer books or podcasts? Um. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I prefer podcasts. Yeah. I prefer the 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 tech the tech solution. The tech solution. Okay. Yeah. Our next question was iPad or notebooks. I'm guessing it's iPad or notebooks. Sorry? Uh, iPad or notebooks? Uh yeah, iPad. 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 Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. And then uh just our last question in this segment was what's your favorite social media? Um whether I have a favorite, I mean, I don't, I, I tend to focus, you know, on social media, I tend to focus on obviously my, my email flow. And, you know, I do LinkedIn. I think probably, you know, if I was pushed, I would say LinkedIn. LinkedIn, okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, that, that concludes our final segment. And, and we'd like to thank you for giving us your time. My pleasure. Is, is there any sort of motivational quote or learning that you'd like to leave our audience with? So the comment I would make, and it comes from a yeah a book I read at Cambridge actually called uh, The Theory of Managerial Capitalism by Robin Maris, who was a left-wing economist, probably a Marxist, but what he was pointing out was that in companies, in modern capitalist companies, you get a separation between ownership and control. And I think that's the killer. I think closing that gap, and uh, I think... The way you do that is by getting management to put their money where their mouth is. Um, it's a very crude way of putting it, but Warren Buffett said many, many years ago, you wouldn't give a, an institution an option on your stock at zero cost for 10 years. Why do you give management that through options? So options is a heads I win, tells you lose. Not the right thing to do. Oh, well. Thank you again so much for giving us your time. Thank you, Anuj. And I hope England beats New Zealand. I don't think so. (laughs)